Today, we are going to be hearing from my colleague, John Beatty. He has been here since 1984. He has an immense knowledge of genealogical records. Um, he is a CG, so he obviously knows his stuff. He is our bibliographer, and he is our in-house expert for German records, Scotch-Irish, um, local history. So John, we are excited to hear about using text records and genealogical research. So thank you. Thank you, Allison. Welcome, everyone. We're going to be looking at tax records today, which is a really important source. And we'll, we will start with um, a famous quote uh, by Benjamin Franklin, who said that nothing in this world can be said to be certain except death and taxes. And um, not coincidentally, but uh, both death records and tax records are important sources for genealogists to use. Uh, taxes of various types have been with us for a very long time ever since the very beginnings of America in colonial times. Uh, tax records varied by place and time, and not all such records from every place have survived. Where they do exist, they are extremely valuable and underused uh, as a tool in genealogical research. They are widely available on family search uh, and sometimes also in book form. In this talk, I wanna introduce you to using uh, American tax records in your genealogical research. I hope you will come to see them as valuable census substitutes, even though they are quite different from census records. Uh, unlike census records, they can appear in different forms, a variety of forms, uh, even in the same county. And they do not necessarily record the same people that one might find in census records, which makes them quite valuable to use in tandem with census records when they exist. Uh, they are a valuable record for the, for the years between the federal censuses or in periods where no federal census records exist. Uh, they can be especially useful in counties where other records, such as deeds and probate records, have been lost. Uh, we'll show you some examples. Uh, because tax records are considered original, direct sources, they have inherent value for genealogical research and are worth the effort it often takes to use them, even though they may not be indexed. The goals of this talk are first to provide you with an overview of the different types of tax records. And second, I wanna show you how they can be valuable in solving a brick wall problem. Um, third, I will wanna walk through some case studies and show you how tax records can be effective uh, in, in any kind of genealogical problem where they exist and, and how to glean the most from them. I wanna first begin with a good book that I highly recommend on the topic. Uh, it is. Uh, by Carol Cook Darrow and Susan Winchester. It's called The Genealogist's Guide to Researching Tax Records. Uh, it was published by Heritage Books in 2007. It's a bit out of date in terms of what's been done digitally, but it's still very solid in terms of the techniques that it describes and the types of tax records that are in it. You will find it listed in your handout. Most of the tax records I'm going to discuss are explained uh, in more detail in this book. While some of the examples come from my own research, uh, I'm also going to show you one example that does not, but came from a patron here that I just happened to help recently. Uh, and, and many of the research strategies, strategies I will discuss are laid out in more detail uh, in this volume. Many different kinds of tax, taxes have been collected over the centuries, for, but for our purposes, we will focus on five main categories. They, in, they include first land taxes or taxes on real estate owned by a person. They may include acreage or houses or other improvements made to a parcel of land, such as wharves, if you're living on the seacoast. A tax may be calculated, for example, from the number of windows or fireplaces that a house has. Uh, two, personal property taxes, taxes paid on items owed by a person. These may include taxes on livestock, such as horses or cattle, or on slaves, if it's in a, in a, a slave state or even on such items as carriages or clocks, mills, ships, and tools. Sometimes these were, these were combined with land taxes, but oftentimes they were separate. Uh, three, we're gonna talk about estate or probate taxes, just a little, just a little mention of those. Those are really fall into the category of probate records, which is a little bit beyond the scope of this, but there were taxes that were paid at the time of probate. Uh, four, federal taxes, um, and five, other, which are church taxes or tithes, uh, license fees, um, road work orders, which is when someone is ordered to work on a, a, on a road, which is kind of a, a tax on labor. So these are some of the things we're going to explore. 
Um, the challenges are many, um, and, and, but, uh, and, but it's changed quite a bit since I first gave this talk. Um, in the first place, uh, tax records can be difficult to locate and access. Um, unlike federal census records, which are digitized and widely uh, available online, tax records are not always readily available. That was very much so when I first gave this talk in 2017, but since um, family search has begun digitizing its wide collection of, um, of microfilms and put them on family search, uh, there are considerably more uh, tax records that are digitally available now than, than what was only the case only a few years ago. Uh, two, tax records can be challenging to interpret. Unlike census records, which, are, which follow a prescribed form, tax records can vary widely in appearance um, and, uh, and from state to state and even within states, depending on the time period, the personal style of the tax uh, assessor and what was being taxed. The columns may not even be identified, but it's always good to take a very good close look at the very beginning pages of a census schedule or, excuse me, of a tax list to see what categories are maybe, maybe be taxed at the time. Um, if you're going to use them to, to maximum effect, you definitely want to, to know what the categories are that are being recorded. You also need to look closely at the numbers of what's being taxed, uh, livestock, slaves, acres of land, and look for subtle changes. Uh, year by year. Uh, so, um, and four, tax records can consume some time. Um, uh, uh, three or three, they can be difficult to read, especially in the 1700s. Uh, the condition can be poor and they were not stored properly. And four, uh, you really have to look at that all of them to, cons to get their full value. Um, and, and then it does require some time to look at all of them collectively uh, to see what uh, you can glean from them because a tax list in, in isolation can be fine, but it's more valuable when it's studied in the context of other lists and other years. Many benefits. Um, uh, they can provide, um, uh, not as, not, they're not proof necessarily that a person lived at a particular place at a certain time because people could own land in a particular county and be taxed on even though they didn't live there. But it is a proof of a connection that a person had with a particular place. So it can be a, a evidence of someone uh, in a particular time and place. Uh, it could tax, tax records can help track movement from one place to the next. Uh, and this is the advantage of having a year by year record. If someone disappears from a tax list one year, then reappears in a, in a new place in, in another subsequent year, it's, it's a great proof of, of movement of, uh, of a person. Uh, three, um, it can help establish the time period when a person first established residence in a particular place. The first time they appear on a tax list can be one of two things. A, they moved there, or B, the person is old enough to be assessed a tax. Um, so it could be of also proof of someone's age or coming into the, an age of majority. Um, uh, four, it can confirm land ownership and that can lead you then to look for deeds of a person. If you know that someone's being taxed on land, there's a very good chance that there are deed records or land grant records for that particular place. Uh, five, they can document landless ancestors. And this can be very important uh, if you're looking at personal property tax lists because they can tax rather poor people. People who had very little property at all can sometimes appear on a, on a property tax rule. They may not appear in a census rule. They may be working for someone or being in a, someone else's household and hence not appear on a census record, but they may appear on a personal property tax list or a woman may appear on a personal property tax list when she did not appear uh, in a census uh, as a head of household. So they can be really valuable in that respect. Um, six, uh, they can differentiate between two or more people with the same name in the same place. How many of us have had problems when we're looking for a common name in a particular county and we see two people of the same name, maybe a father and son, maybe cousins, maybe people not related at all. So looking at tax lists and putting them in context with other people on a tax list in a particular location, often by a township or a hundred or some land division can help us um, with uh, name division. And sometimes there are even um, nicknames that people used at the time uh, to help differentiate people. And those nicknames will show up in the tax lists too, which can be really interesting. I had a, ancestor, a relative who had the nickname Cucumber why, I don't know, uh, but he was called John Vick, 
alias Cucumber in the tax list, and then his son was called uh, John of Cucumber. And having a, a nickname like that, whether it was his nose or whether he's a growing cucumbers, I don't know. But th those are the kind of local things that a local assessor knew and often put those uh, in. Uh, seven, they can provide uh, clues about age, um, identifying young men as they reach adulthood and are taxed for the first time. Uh, I have seen tax lists in Virginia that designate fathers and sons by name uh, on the same lines when the son came uh, of age and was taxed with the father. So that can be a great proof of, uh, of, of relationships, especially in Virginia when the records can be very difficult uh, to use. Um, you have to know the tax laws to know when someone was of age to be taxed. It could be 16, it could be 18, it could be 21, depending on the time and place, but that can be really helpful. Uh, I have found it not to not always be gospel. Uh, I've seen some people get taxed for the first time at a, a slightly later age than what the legal uh, requirements were, and sometimes even earlier. Um, so, but it's a, still a good measurement, a benchmark uh, to use. Uh, Eight, they can help establish a year of an ancestor's death. Um, so a person's name may appear such as the John Cook estate uh, in a record where he was John Cook the year before, which suggests that he had died uh, in that time period. So that can give you a, a, a narrow, narrowing view. Um, be aware though that someone drops off a tax list, it may not necessarily mean that they've died. Uh, in some localities, in some places, people were ex made exempt from taxes when they reached a certain age. Uh, and so they may not appear in the tax list, but they may still very much be alive. They may appear on census records. It might be a clue for you to look at um, a, a court record minutes uh, if they exist for the place, because there's usually a, a court minute where the court said that so-and-so was exempt from paying taxes because of age. Uh, nine, it can help determine the wealth of your ancestor uh, relative to his neighbors. And that might be an interesting fact to know if you're trying to write a family history, if your ancestor had a lot more horses or, or cows than anyone else in, the, in this township, that certainly places him in the context of his neighbors. And that can, can be useful and helpful uh, as we begin trying to, try to figure out how our ancestors lived and what their, what their lifestyle was like. Um, 10, it can offer clues about other records, such as deeds, wills, census records, and voting records. Uh, as I said, if someone owned land, there are almost certainly a deed in that area. If he died and there's an estate listed in the tax rolls, there might certainly be a will or uh, an estate record if they exist. Um, while there may be differences from sac tax, while there may be differences from census records and tax records, uh, tax records are valuable as census substitutes. Uh, federal census enumerations were only taken every 10 years, and there are years where the census, uh, censuses are lost, um, like for New Jersey, for example, for the first 20 years or 30 years, there, there are no records. Virginia is lost for 1790 and 1800. Uh, Virginia, or tax records were taken every year, and assessors often did a better job at finding everyone than census enumerators, at least in terms of locating those eligible to pay taxes. Uh, and that can be especially important as substitutes for missing, as I say, these missing census schedules. Uh, they're also valuable for identifying people living in a county before 1850 when the census has only covered the heads of household. So we need to develop uh, a research strategy um, and, and and that's what we're going to talk about next is how to go about approaching um, these records because they can vary greatly from time and place. The first essential strategy is to search out all other relevant documents about the family or person you are studying, uh, wills, deeds, secondary county histories, published genealogies. Um, we certainly want to look at all the census records that are available if they're, if they're at a time and place where there are census records. Tax records may go back much earlier, though, and in the colonial period before the 1790 census, especially for Pennsylvania and for a little bit for Virginia, which can make them very valuable. Um, you want to look for vital records, of course, and, and deeds and courthouse records, and then use them in conjunction with the tax records if you can. It can be helpful and, and can give more meaning to them if you use them all in conjunction. For example, if you're sorting men named John Smith in Montgomery County, Tennessee in the 1830s and 1840s, be sure to have all the census records extracted and the deeds identified before you get into the tax, tax records because the combination of all of them together will be the, the, the roadmap that you'll wanna use to um, distinguish people of the same name in the same place. 
Know the geography of the place being taxed. It's important to have some background on when and how a county was formed and the identity of its parent county if it was created out of another. So if, for example, Clark County, Ohio was created out of, in 1818 out of Champaign County, and you know you're researching ancestors in the early tax records of Clark, it's important to know that before 1818, the records were going to be in the parent county of Champaign. Uh, books such as the Handy Book for Genealogists uh, will give you a list of American counties uh, when they were created and their parent county or counties. If a new county was carved out of more than one earlier county, it may require more detective work and maps to determine which portion of the county your ancestor held land or lived and what specific place uh, to look for tax records. But you may have to explore the tax records of several uh, counties in order to find your person and they may have moved around. It's helpful for genealogists to have a basic awareness of the tax laws that prevailed in the state at the time we were researching. Since tax records varied in style and content depending on the region and the legal practices of the locality, the tax collection process also differed. Uh, part of your research strategy should be understand those differences. Were white males with personal property taxed at 16, 18, 21? Did they come off the rolls at a particular age or only at death? Who is exempt from paying taxes? Were women, free blacks, and Indians taxed or exempt? Uh, these are important questions. In some places, you may need to become expert at the historical tax law in order to fully understand the laws as they have, in the particular state where your ancestors lived. Be aware that the tax process was distinct uh, depending on the region. Many of the state statute books are online uh, uh, and you can find them on like uh, Internet Archive for a particular state and a particular time period. In colonial New England, for example, a, a head of household sub submitted to the town a list of real and personal property taxes owned. The assessor then would view the land and livestock, assess the value and collect the tax. Those who couldn't pay were listed as defaulters. And so you'll find those listed in the, in the, the records. In 1771, people were taxed not only on the amount of land, but also on what the land was expected to produce since the colony uh, based its tax rates on the ability of a piece of land to produce. Uh, these were, there were taxes levied on the tons of hay and whether produced in upland or on salt marsh. Uh, they were taxed on the number of cattle a pasture would keep and the number of barrels of cider produced. Let's see, there, there are detailed, often detailed records of livestock. In some colonies such as Maryland and South Carolina, landowners had to submit information about the number of acres owned and how they came in possession of the land. Sometimes previous owners were listed. In many Southern colonies, there was an established church and tithes were collected, kind of flat tax based on the number of taxable persons and slaves in a household. Sometimes legal customs and practices of the county or state is important for interpreting the tax records of that place. Always check genealogy guides for the state you are researching too. Uh, many of these have chapters that discuss the tax laws and records of the states, where the records are located and how to use them. Uh, some examples are Helen Leary's book on North Carolina research, genealogy and local history, and, and Carol McGinnis's book, Virginia Genealogy, Sources and Resources. These are both on your, on your handout. Also useful is Sandra Lubking's chapter on land records in the source. Uh, they are all listed on your handout. You may also need to look at law books or state statute books for the for the places. So where to go to find them? Uh, the fourth strategy is to know where to look. And, and, and the fifth is to look at all of the tax lists available for the time and place that, that you're interested in researching. Um, even if uh, the lists are alphabetized as they usually the case, uh, you go through the whole list because names may be listed out of place or additional names may appear at the end of a list, often poor people, uh, and describe all the pertinent information that you find. So let's go back to the fourth strategy, which is uh, where to write for these records and, and or where to find these records. As I said, some have been reprinted in books, some have been microfilmed, um, many have been digitized through family search, uh, one of the best places to go to look for them. Uh, still others may not be published at all and may be found in manuscript collections in state libraries or even in courthouses. So if you're here in the genealogy center, you'll want to check our catalog under the name of the, the state or the county and the word tax. For example, typing Massachusetts in tax brings up Betty Hobbs Pruitt's 924 page book, Massachusetts, Mass excuse me, Massachusetts Tax Evaluation List of 1771, which as I said, is a massive list of people who were assessed both personal and real estate taxes just before the Revolutionary War. Uh, it serves almost as a census of Massachusetts and Maine 
uh, for this time period for most people above 21, as well as some females. Uh, searching Virginia and tax brings up uh, many hits, uh, but one of the, them is, uh, is a good one is Nettie Schreiner Yantis's three volume 1780 census of Virginia, an accounting of the name of every white male tithable over 21 years. Uh, as though it does say, not say so in the title, this is a sub census substitute based on personal property tax list for every county in Virginia in 1787, and it therefore fills a, a substitute for the missing 1790 census. Both of these published works are frozen in time in a particular year, and because they are printed, they are indirect rather than direct sources of information. In other words, you're not looking at an image of the original handwritten record, and you may not uh, see the be seeing the list in the context of the other names on that list. So it's always go, good to go back to the original source if you can find it. Uh, there are often more lists that are not published. And by looking at them year by year, carefully comparing the names and looking for changes in the amount of tax and what is being taxed, you can often pick up additional details and clues. These are the two books that I'm talking about, the 1771 uh, Massachusetts tax list and the three volume uh, 1787 uh, tax list by Nettie Schreiner Yantis. Another good source to look for, uh, and I have it on your, your handout if you're doing Virginia research, is the BINS genealogy tax uh, site. Uh, BINS, B-I-N-N-S, um, they have a website uh, that is searchable. Now I've had some difficulties getting on this site. It seems to work intermittently. Sometimes it works great. Sometimes you can't always get to it. You can Google Bins Genealogy Tax and try to get it that way. You can also do Bins Genealogy 1790 or 1800. Uh, but what they've done is they've taken all the tax lists that, that, that survive for 1790 and for 1800 and put together uh, uh, an every name in, uh, index to them in one alphabetical sequence. So if you don't know the county that your ancestor in Virginia lived in, you can search this. Uh, under the name and, and find um, potential lists. So it's a, a really good tool. Um, I'm waiting for the day that uh, the Virginia tax lists will be uh, fully digitized and fully indexed on some major um, genealogy aggregator like Ancestry or, or Family Search. I hope that day will, will one day come. Uh, BINS is as close as we have right now. They have a, something called the Tax Club that you can join for a nominal fee that gives you access to some other counties and other years in between 1790 and 1800. Uh, it's kind of worth it. Um, it's useful. They've digitized a lot of the, the records on it. Um, but when the day comes when these are fully indexed uh, for all of the years, for all of the Virginia counties, it will be a great tool for, for doing Virginia genealogy. The Microtext catalog, some films are on microfilm. And if you're here in the Genealogy Center, you can certainly go to our Microtext catalog and find uh, tax lists for different counties. Here's one for Kenton County, Kentucky, uh, 1840 to 1854, various years. Um, I'm going to, to, to bet that most of the things that we have on microfilm as tax lists are also now digital and available on Family Search. Uh, and that's where you want to go next. In fact, I would suggest going there first. Uh, go to the Family History. Uh, go to the Family Search catalog, look under the county name, then find the county under the state, and then look uh, at the, the, the records for that particular county, and you'll see what's available that, uh, that's been digitized. And in this case, we have land tax lists and personal property tax lists for a county in uh, Virginia. And then if you can see if they're available for you to search, there'll be a little camera icon that you can click on uh, that will let, then take you to the actual uh, lists. Uh, they're especially useful for the states of uh, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Tennessee, uh, as well as New Jersey and Kentucky, in addition to Virginia and Pennsylvania. Uh, those are all states that have key uh, collections of tax lists on them uh, that are really digitized and, and searchable and, and really very helpful. Another place to go is the Periodical Source Index, which is now on our webpage, uh, the genealogycenter.org webpage, uh, which where you can find articles transcribe tax lists for different places and different counties, search under the county, search under the keyword tax, and you may find an article like that 1837 tax list there or 1841 Stanley County, North Carolina tax list uh, or uh, for, for various places, um, depending on the place. So uh, that can be a helpful uh, spot to look at. Additionally, uh, William Dollarhide's book, Census Substitutes and State, State Census Records, 
published in 2008, uh, also has many published tax lists uh, uh, that are have been published in journals on a state-by-state -state basis, and is an excellent guide for finding many obscure published tax lists. I think that one's also on your tax on your handout. You still can't find what you need. You may need to contact a facility in the state or county of your interest. The county clerk may have some tax volumes uh, on hand, but because they're not used regularly like deeds or probate records, they are often stored away in attics or basements or annexes if they've been retained at all. And in some places I, I fear they have been destroyed. Uh, in some places there was no statute to keep tax records as other records. So they were often recycled or thrown away, or they may have been sent off to a state historical society or a state archive. So it's always good to explore several different kinds of uh, venues for them. Uh, in some places, there were actually inventories that were published. Uh, the WPA back during the 1930s uh, produced uh, an inventory of Indiana County records, um, and they, they went county by county. This is the list for 19. 41 for Allen County, Indiana, and they, you see there's a listing there for tax duplicates, 1850 onward, 535 volumes labeled by year. I don't know whether all those volumes continue to survive, but they were extant in 1941 when this, when this uh, inventory was done. So these inventories might exist for the areas which you're researching too, or you're researching, so it might be something to look at. Um, now we're going to turn to turn from research strategies to looking at some specific examples of tax records. Uh, land taxes represent one of the oldest forms of taxes in America. Acreage and dwellings were taxed at the local level uh, in early New England, where people living in close proximity were carefully rated and accounted. Um, because they were chartered by corporations, not proprietors or the crown, taxes were nearly always local. According to the book by Darrow and Winchester, which I mentioned at the outset, uh, tax assessors in Massachusetts and Connecticut rated the land on its use, quality, location, and position. Land on a salt marsh, for example, was not rated as highly as prime agricultural land being used for growing crops as, or as pasture. Uh, the state taxed uh, potential productivity rather than size. So this is a published valued list from, um, from Weston, Massachusetts in 1760. Um, and we can see a combined list of columns showing both personal and real estate with taxable districts divided by north side and by south side and the estimated amount of tax. Um, so the, for this town, all of the extant tax lists from 1757 to 1827 were collected and published in a single volume, which allows you to compare the data. Uh, in this list for the town of Providence, Rhode Island in 1798, um, we see a more detailed record of both tenants and landowners. On the far left column, we see the owner of the property. And after the Roman numeral, we see a description of the property, house, barn, or wharf. And then we see the second column for a tenant or the name of someone who has an association with the property, such as a tenant. Um, and, and then that may, that the tenant may be different than the house owner or the householder. Quit rents were, were collected uh, in Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and the Carolinas uh, by the proprietors of those colonies or their families who obtained grants from the king uh, for the colonies and then regranted the land to settlers. Landowners paid a yearly quit rent to the proprietor based on the land holdings, but these were abolished by the Revolutionary War. In colonial Virginia, landowners paid a yearly quit rent of two shillings per 100 acres owned and if they failed to pay, the colony had the right to take back the land and regrant it to someone else. A few such records are in print for Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Maryland. Uh, this is a quit rents uh, book of a list of people in arrears for Albemarle Carl County, North Carolina for the years 1729 to 1732. So they'll find published works like this for some places. The taxpayers are listed alphabetically showing in order the number of years paid, the number of acres owned, the amount of quit rent in shillings, the amount of uh, in sterling money, currency at seven for one in pounds, shillings, and pence that was owed, and the total currency for a cluster of names. Um, so the value here is we have a landowner and we have numbers of acres owned, which can be helpful. Um, here is one from 1804 in Washington County, Virginia. After the Revolutionary War, Virginia began a statewide system of taxes in 1782 that featured separate lists for land and for 
personal property, such as livestock and slaves. Um, the land tax usually listed the name of the landowner, the amount of the land owned, and, and the assessed value, and the amount of tax owed. In this example from Washington County in 1804, we see the name of the taxpayer, the amount of acreage owned, the amount of tax owed, and the total assessed value of the land. Beginning in 1814, assessors began to add descriptions of the land, its distance from the courthouse, and for new property from whom land was purchased. For many states, including Virginia, the amount and rate of land assessed could vary within the county. It was usually based in part on the amount of real estate owned, but could also be affected by the, the quality of the land being assessed. Arable farmland was considered more valuable than wetlands or woodland. Here's a list from Ohio, uh, from uh, Huron County, Ohio in 1823. We see that there are listed lists of residents and non-residents. Uh, and the owners are listed alphabetically in separate columns. This makes it easy to tell who is actually living in the county, but you, but, but you go through the list, you can see how many out of county people held land for investment purposes. Many places did not in, differentiate. So you have to be aware of, of that for the place. So some tips for using land tax records, read the entire list from start to finish um, because names can be listed out of place. Other names can be listed at the end of the schedule. Um, get accustomed to the quirks of the tax collector and the manner in which he prepared the rolls. Look for unusual abbreviations or ditto marks. The tax collectors often had special nicknames, as I said before. Uh, pay close attention to these distinctions. Sometimes you'll see a father's name listed in parentheses, or you will, like after the name, showing that who was so, the son of, of whom. Um, you'll also want to see the kind of physical characteristics. Uh, someone may, with red hair might be designated John Redhead versus... John Brownhead or something. Um, uh, Barbara Vines Little uses tax records in an article for distinguished men named William Lee in Orange County, Virginia in the early 1800s. One was named Mountain Leader, such as William Lee Sr. Another was called William Lee of Governor's Ford. Another was William Son of William. Another was William Son of John. And another had no, no nickname. So finding these nicknames in the records can really help us distinguish people. Um, uh, it can be, as I said, a clue to the existence of deed records, so beware of that. Um, and they can also provide legal descriptions for, for real estate for some areas, which can be helpful too. Uh, look for notations for structures on the lists about houses or outbuildings, which can be really helpful. They can sort of give you a picture of what the farm might have looked like at the time it was being taxed. Uh, and and look, look at the comparisons year by year because someone may have built a barn or an outbuilding in a, in a different year from before and or the house may have been expanded. So it can be really helpful uh, giving you some unusual clues that you wouldn't find otherwise. Uh, delinquent taxes were often published in newspapers. Um, when someone was delinquent in paying their real estate taxes, the names would often appear uh, in, in, a, in a newspaper. Not all delinquents were deadbeats or impoverished, however. Sometimes there were people who had moved out of the area but still owned land in their former residence. Some were missing a tax time and not there to pay their tax. Uh, sometimes you will find a clue in a tax list about where someone moved, which can be a clue, uh, direct evidence of about your ancestral family is going to some other place. Um, so be aware of these. Uh, personal property tax lists uh, were often kept separately from land tax lists. And since they were included the names of people who did not own land, they can be a more comprehensive source for local population with more accurate listing of names than a census record. Uh, you, or, or also a land, re land tax record, which only listed land owners. You'll also find them combined occasionally with land tax records in some places and time periods. Massachusetts personal property taxes were extant from the 1730 as early or 1700, 17th century as early as 1630 in some places. Uh, in 1646, the colony established a structured tax system where a variety of personal items were taxed, including ships, wharves, houses, uh, cattle, mills, and other merchantable goods. Livestock was considered the most valuable type of personal property and was rated individually by animal. In 1700, livestock was taxed at a fixed value and, personal, and other personal property based on a market value a system that remained in effect until the Revolutionary War uh, in 1777. In Virginia, they were originally taxed as tithables and some lists, all tithables, including slaves, were grouped under one number. Uh, statewide taxing of personal property began in 1782, which I said uh, whites and slaves were separated on the lists. 
Uh, the list included tax on white poles, that is white males above 21, black poles above 16, that included slaves, horses, cattle, and wheels of carriages, a four-wheeled carriage being taxed higher than a two-wheeled one. Uh, the earliest lists in the 1780s actually listed the names of slaves, which I'll show you in a minute. Later tax lists were, were assessed on the number of blacks uh, as well above as well as below 16. Older white men were often exempt. Um, there were lists uh, from 1777 in North Carolina. They taxed uh, a variety of luxury items. Uh, and Helen Leary talks about those in her book on North Carolina research. In Kentucky, like Virginia, kept both uh, personal and real property tax lists at a very early date. And they are extant for most counties beginning in the 1790s. Many of these are published in a book called Early Kentucky Tax Records, which was published in 1984. Um, the typical tax list from the 18th to early 19th century included a tax on white poles above 21, white poles above 16 and below 21, total blacks, blacks under 16, horses, mares, colts, and mules, cattle, and the total number of acres of land. Ohio and Indiana uh, taxed both real and personal property on combined lists. Here's an example from Weston, Massachusetts. We showed one earlier, but this is a, a list from 1760 showing the list of, of the tax taxables. Here's a list from Kentucky, Franklin County, Kentucky, 1795. Again, it's printed, names are alphabetized. Uh, here are, here's a tax list, genealogical from Cook and, uh, example from uh, Cook and Darrow's Genealogist Guide to Researching Tax Records. This is, um, uh, inheritance or, or estate tax records, which are scarce. Um, these are taxes or fees that were imposed by the court when an estate is settled or probated. Sometimes you'll find these in a probate packet, but sometimes you'll find them on separate lists. The basis of the levy was determined uh, by the value of the estate after deductions were made. So, and this is a legacy tax uh, levied on the right to inherit personal property. A succession tax is imposed specifically on the right to inherit real property or land. Uh, and this is a, a New Jersey list from 1912, uh, which is pretty late for our period, but uh, the federal government opposed the Stamp Act in, uh, in 1797 on receipts of, of legacies on inherited property. Uh, so 25 cents for legacies valued from 50 to 100, 50 cents for a legacy between 100 and 500. The tax was, um, limited to non-direct relatives or non-relatives since widows, children, and grandchildren were exempt. The tax went into effect in 1798 and was repealed in 1802, but sometimes you'll find stamps affixed to the, uh, the probate records um, showing that they had paid the tax. During the 1862, during the Civil War, an effort to generate revenue, the government opposed another stamp tax on probated wills, but only the imposed value if the, if the state value exceeded $1,000. Uh, and this time, direct relatives were not exempt. So children and siblings of the deceased had to pay a tax of 0.75%. Descendants of siblings had a, had a tax of 0.15%, or excuse me, 1.5%. Aunts and uncles paid a, a 3% tax. So kind of interesting. In 1916, there was a new law in, uh, during World War I, or at the eve of World War I, imposed on a tax on all probated estates after funeral and administrative expenses and other losses. And a, $50,000 exemption was also taken. Um, states also imposed probate and, and estate taxes. Uh, as I said, this is the New Jersey tax list that we see here. Uh, sometimes you'll find other types of tax lists. This is an, an Allen County, Indiana inheritance tax order book from 1915. Uh, so there, there, we do have an, a tax record here in our own county from 1914 to 1928. And this lists the name of the deceased the cause number of the court case, uh, the date of death if given, and the names of the heirs with their relationship. So it can be really helpful. Uh, I want now to, now to turn to federal taxes, which are a wonderful and often underutilized source of research. The US Constitution of 1789 gave Congress the power to levy taxes, which had been omitted under the earlier Articles of Confederation. There are three main collections of historical federal taxes available to genealogists. Um, the 1798 direct tax uh, and the direct tax of 1861 and the federal income tax of 1861 to 1872. We'll look at some examples. Uh, the direct tax of 1798 was, was taxed, uh, was levied on land, dwelling houses and slaves throughout the United States in response 
to Napoleon and the, and the possibility of war with France. The government was afraid under the John Adams administration and they wanted to, to tax property uh, valued at less than 100, uh, uh, at a greater than $100. Uh, but, uh, but even all tax, all number of items were, were taxed on these lists. Uh, if houses and outbuildings were valued at between $100 and $500, the owner was, was assessed two tenths of 1% of the valuation. If a house increased in value, uh, the tax rate jumped up from 1%, uh, up to 1% of the assessed value. There was also a 50% or 50 cents tax for each slave owned. Uh, some, the amount of, of revenue raised from taxing houses and slaves was deducted from the total amount of tax due from each state. The rest of the taxes were levied from, uh, from tracts of land that did not contain houses. Um, these federal tax lists vary and uh, usually follow prescribed forms. Uh, they usually include the name of the owner, the, the quantity or tract of land or lot, and a description of the dwellings or out dwellings. Sometimes the information is quite specific, giving the dimensions of the house, the dimensions of the, or the building material, whether it was log or frame or brick or stone, and the number of windows or panes of glass, which are called lights. Um, there were different schedules that made up the 1798 direct tax. Not all of the schedules survive for all places. One part recorded information about land and houses valued at more than $100. Another had values that were valued at under $100. And then sometimes they just had land. Uh, so all of the Pennsylvania 1790 tax schedules survive, which makes it one of the key states to have this survive. Uh, for other places, they've been lost. Uh, for Connecticut, there are some uh, lists that are extant for some counties. For Georgia, only two counties survive. In Maryland, there are lists for about half of the counties, and some have been published, and others are in the, the Maryland Historical Society. For Massachusetts and Maine, most lists survive and are located in the New England, New England Historical Genealogical Society, but they're not digitized. For New Hampshire, only one district survives. For New Jersey, parts of Morris, Monmouth, Salem, and Burlington counties survive, but the records have been dispersed. For New, York, for New York, only parts of Orange and Ulster County survive. For Rhode Island, only partial lists for a certain town survive. So it's too bad that these aren't, aren't fully complete, but they are complete for Pennsylvania. Um, there are other uh, direct tax lists that exist too. Uh, there's a direct tax taken in 1813, 1815, and 1816. Uh, only a few schedules survive for Rhode Island. Uh, at the outbreak of the Civil War, Congress passed the direct tax of 1861 with a goal of raising $20 million to fight the war. Uh, assessment of property began in 1862, and property valued at, at under $500 was exempt. The following year, Congress passed the Act for the Collection of Direct Taxes in the ins in Insurrectionary Districts, which allowed the government to tax Confederate states. Uh, these states, these records have been microfilmed. Um, but we don't have them here in our library. They may be available on Family Search, but I'm not sure. Uh, here is an example of the IRS tax of 1862 to 1872, which was be which began during the Civil War and continued afterwards. Um, Ancestry has these online, but they're not always readily available. So you have to really dig in the Ancestry catalog to find them. But they do give great information. I highlighted my own great great grandfather Ross Beatty in Plain Township, Kosciuszko County. Uh, on the, the, this particular list from 1864, and it shows the amount of his tax. Um, the description of his land, um, how many acres was being taxed, the amount of the tax, and the total amount of tax paid. So he paid a, a total tax of like five dollars and thirty uh, thirty-one cents, and only 40, 40 acres there were taxed. But he had more land, and, he, and it's possible someone may appear on these lists more than one time. So you really have to go through them to to find them, uh, to find everything that's there. Here's an IRS tax list from 1864, which shows Samuel Hanna of Fort Wayne. Sam Hanna was one of the most wealthy people in, uh, in living in Fort Wayne at that time. And he was taxed on uh, his income, his, on two four-wheeled carriages and two two-wheeled carriages and 65 ounces of silver plate. Uh, you're not gonna find a lot of genealogical information here, but it still gives you a picture of him and, and, and the amount of his wealth uh, in relation to other people in the city and shows uh, some of the personal property that he had that, um, that was specifically taxed. 
Uh, here's an example of a tithe records book in many of the middle colonies in New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, tithes or religious taxes were paid to support the Church of England. The money was collected and managed by vestries or by boards of churches to build and maintain new churches, pay ministers salaries, and distribute aid to the poor. Massachusetts established the Congregational Church as its official church in 1660 and required its support by taxes. After the Revolutionary War, taxes were still levied in some places to, report, to support churches, but the adoption of the Bill of Rights, which mandated no establishment of religion, then tithes appear, disappeared. Uh, only a few taxes survived. This is one from Loudoun County, Virginia. Uh, from there's a book of them from 1758 to 1786. This example is from 1749. It has uh, remarks in there which can be interested. They see people down there listed as Quakers, people listed as Papists. Uh, one is listed as an Anabaptist, so it shows they were not part of the church, um, but shows the but it can be useful, useful and valuable for information about the people that are listed there. Road orders, um, these were in many places. Um, there were requests for building new roads or maintaining roads, especially in Virginia uh, in the 1700s. And so the court would order a person to become a road leader, a road master, essentially. And they would assign people who had land along the proposed road to be hands or people that would help build the road. And so you assign these their, their taxes, essentially, uh, in labor, uh, requiring people to pay in their labor uh, to, to help build these roads. So you'll find these records in the court records uh, of the various counties um, if they survive. Uh, licenses are also a form of tax. If someone wanted to open a, a tavern, for example, they had to pay a, a tax to, for a license to, be, to have that, also to operate a, a ferry or to become a peddler or an auctioneer or to distill spirits. Uh, all were required licenses. And this is an example of, a, of such a license from Middlesex County, New Jersey, 1717. It shows you um, the, the amount of tax being paid and the, the signatures of the people getting the license. So it's kind of interesting. They come in many different forms too. There's, a, there's an example of a, a Warren County, Kentucky license book uh, where they were taxing horses, jacks, bulls, merchants, taverns, coffee houses, playing cards, patent medicines, billiard tables, insurance agents, circus and menageries, clocks and peddlers, all kinds of different things are being taxed. So um, it can be quite interesting um, uh, when you find those kinds of things. So I'm going to go through a case study for the remainder of time. I'm going to try to go through two case studies and show you how you can use tax records to solve brick wall problems uh, and how you can, can make the most of them. So I'm going to begin with, with this particular case study. In this, in this case, we have two people. Uh, one was named William Pendleton Vick and his wife, Alma Gertrude Oakes. And they were told by their parents um, and relatives at the time when they got married that they had they were third cousins, that their um, uh, great-grandmothers were sisters, or excuse me, um, great-great, yeah, there'd be their great, great-great-grandmothers were, were sisters. So what we find here then is a, a, a possible link. We know that um, William Pendleton Vicks, we see his line going back to when Elizabeth Cook, whose maiden name is not proved, who had married a man named John Mills, and her sister Catherine, apparently named Cook, married a man named Thomas Oakes, and how the, how the proposed genealogy goes. So we're, we want to try to prove this through our tax records. And uh, the family came from um, uh, King and Queen County, which we'll talk about in a minute, but our, we want to apply our research steps. We want to survey all of the available sources that we have, know the geography of our area, know the tax laws that are available, uh, locate the tax records that exist, and then read the, the records thoroughly. In our instance here, excuse me, um, uh, Kentucky atlases show that the Mills family came from King and Queen County, Virginia, and moved to Kentucky in 1815. King and Queen was largely burned. Uh, there are no deed records. There are no a few wills that were, were recorded in surrounding counties, but none of the actual will books survived. So we have no deeds or wills or court records at all. Um, Land and personal property tax lists from Virginia began to be kept in 1782, and they survived for this county because they were kept in Richmond and the, at, the, at the capital and not in the local county courthouse, which burned. So because of that, uh, we have tax lists we can look at this county, and we can see these records digitally online. 
So we want to look at our map. We want to make sure we're, we're, we're studying the area well and, I mean, know our geography. So we want to look at the maps and see what, the, what are the counties around it. What are the two districts? We found that there's two districts, South Farnham District and Christchurch District, which are the two taxing districts. Um, those are less few, that's Middlesex. The one in, Saint, in King and Queen is St. Stephen's District and Stratton Major Parish. So they're both parishes that are in that particular county. And those are the two tax districts, but we'll see when we get into the records. So we get into the actual list. And we're gonna look at a man named John Cook, whose estate is taxed uh, in uh, the 1814 tax list. Uh, and this gives us a clue that he's, that, that the man named John Cook had been deceased, uh, but that he had property. So we wanna look at, begin studying these, these tax lists and begin looking at in more detail. But we also see a notation after it that says, um, uh, which I'll blow up here in the next row, that says by deed, the land was being sold by Eliza Cook, William Richardson and wife, Thomas Oakes and wife, and John Mills and wife, uh, which is a nice little notation there that shows that uh, John Cook's estated land was, was being sold to Thomas Jones. If we go back, uh, that had been sold, it was 275 acres, and the people selling it were Eliza Cook and then and William Richardson, Thomas Oakes, and John Mills. Well, that's quite interesting if we go back to our genealogy because Thomas Oakes and John Mills are the great people that are on the genealogy that we're, that we're finding here. And we find that Eliza is probably the, the widow of John Cook and that those are his, his married daughters. They don't give the na names of the daughters, but they do give the names of the sons-in-law. So that gives us a, a clue that for a county that has no deed records, um, we can get that information just out of a tax list. So we want to begin going through all the tax lists that we can. And the, the earliest one was from 1782. And we find that in this particular list that um, uh, a John Cook is being listed on 300 acres of land. And those are the, the assessed values of the land in the 400 of King and Queen County. Then in 18, 1782, the personal property tax list, we see John Cook listed with, listed with Henry Cook. And then we see the following slaves by name, John, Sarah, Bet, I think Preston and Millie, uh, which is quite interesting because it gives us some specific uh, slave names, which could be helpful for an African-American doing research too. Um, so we, we see the, the list of the personal property there. Uh, actually, that's Reuben. But anyway, that's the the tax list, uh, the personal property list there. And then 83, we see in the, the personal property list, he's there, uh, but the slaves are not specifically named in that particular year. And then in 84, the, the sense that the, the slaves were again named by specific name. Henry Cook is no longer listed with his father. We assume that he's listed on his own as his own head of household. So he's now of age to be taxed on his own. He's beyond 21. Uh, John Cook is still alive, and he has the following slaves, George, Sarah, Betty, Tithe, and Millie. And then it gives their, their values. And then we go to um, the personal property tax list, uh, 1785, I think. And there's three of those same slaves listed, George, Sarah, and Betts are there. And then we go to the land tax of 1787. And lo and behold, we see John Cook's estate. We no longer see uh, the, the land that he owned, although the, the number of acres, 300, is still the same as it was a few years older when John Cook was still alive. So now we're alerted to the fact that John Cook had died. He had died sometime between 1786 and 1787 because his estate appears in the 1787 list. So this is a, a clue for a death record that we just, we simply get from a tax list. In the personal property tax list for the same year, we see Eliza Cook listed uh, and no longer John Cook's estate. The, the estate applies to the land, but does not apply to the personal property. So we, we have a clue here for the widow's name as being Eliza, which, which corresponds with what we found in the earlier 1814 tax list that I showed. So we have a name of a widow that comes from a tax list that when we compare the land tax with the, with the personal property tax list. Uh, and we can follow Eliza through time. And, uh, and one year we can find her here. This is, I believe, uh, 1788. We see uh, her listed with a John Cook, who was obviously her son. And he's obviously 21 years of age. And he's listed as a, a, a male tithe or a male, white male po pole in the household with his mother. Uh, so that can be a clue to, to males that are, that, are, that are of age being taxed with their parents in these lists. So you can go up the page, you can see a Ros 
a Priscilla car up at the top and there's a Thomas B car listed with her. That's probably a son listed with her. So we can get, we can get um, glimpses of people who were being taxed with their parents uh, in these lists. Sometimes you'll find um, a, a, a both the father and the son listed together on here. Like uh, if you go down two, two lines below Eliza Cook, you'll see Richard Carlton Jr. And you'll see, you'll see a Richard Carlton Jr. and a, and a Joseph Carlton Jr. They're listed in the same in the same household. So use them for those kinds of clues, these early lists. Here's a 1789 uh, tax list. Uh, and by this time, Eliza Cook is listed, but, no, but John Cook is no longer listed on his own. He has his own uh, listing, I believe, on his uh, a separate listing apart from his mother. And Henry Cook is there as well. So it gives you a clue that he had now gone off on his and was taxed on his own household. So by comparing the list from year to year, we get a glimpse. Um, and then we find her again in 1811, Elizabeth Cook listed uh, on the tax list with uh, the number of slaves and horses that are here. She, was, uh, she had one black who was about 16, two horses, uh, and now owned a two-wheel two gig or buggy. We don't have time to study all these lists in this tax in this example, but you can see how the lists together were used to help put this together. So the John Cook estate uh, appears on the land tax list until 1814 when it disappears. The original 300 acres had been reduced. Elizabeth Cook appears in the personal property tax list until 1814 when the John Cook land was sold and the family moved to Kentucky. Uh, the family reappears uh, in Jessamine County, Kentucky, both Thomas Oaks and John Mills. John Cook Jr., who first appears as a taxable or as a tithable in 1788 when he turned 21, died in 1797, and his land then went to a state there. So just using the tax list, we were able to put together a, a picture of this family. John Cook dies or between 1786 and 87. His wife may be Elizabeth Cardwell. She's listed with Cardwells on the tax list. She dies about 1820. Uh, and these are her, her approximate children. Henry, who may have been from an earlier wife, John Cook Jr., an unknown daughter who married William Richardson, Catherine, who married uh, Thomas Oakes, and Elizabeth, who married John Mills. So we can pull this together using just the tax lists and then some later lists that we have from Kentucky. Uh, I want to look for the, for the last, as we close, another neat example. This just came to me a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I got permission from the patron to use this for my talk. Uh, I had a patron come in who was researching Aaron Christopher who was born in 1818, and he appeared for the first time on a tax list in Fayette County, uh, Pennsylvania, in Luzerne Township. And there were other Christophers listed with him, including a William Christopher listed right next to him uh, on the list. These are alphabetized lists, but they can still be clumped together even within an alphabetized role. So the question is, who is the father of Aaron, uh, who was born in 1818? So we begin by looking at our geography like we're supposed to do and we have a, an, a map of Fayette County and we can see that there are a number of townships here clustered together. Luzerne is right on the, the green Washington County line, but it adjoins Redstone and Manalan and German townships. We can look at um, an, an earlier, much earlier tax list from 1809 in Fayette County and what is German township and we find a Daniel Christopher listed there who is of interest to us and as a possible father. Uh, these lists go back well into the 1700s, so you can, you can really go year by year forwards and backwards in, in searching people. But we go forward for the purposes of this talk, and we, we, there are other Christophers listed on here. There's, a, uh, there's another, a Barnett Christopher, you know, at the, notice at the top there, but he lives all the way into the period of time that, that uh, Aaron lived, so we know that Barnett is not his father. Could be a brother, but we don't really know for sure. We go to the 1818 list and Daniel drops off the list. He's no longer listed and, there, and all of a sudden we see a Hannah Christopher listed for the first time and she's listed as widow. Uh, these particular tax lists uh, show occupations. So we see shoemaker, farmer, widow, laborer, which is really kind of neat. Uh, not all tax lists do this, but this one did. And then we do then see Hannah listed as a widow. And then we go to 1820. There is no 1819 list, but at the end of the list, Elizabeth doesn't appear at all under her own name, but we see a list of poor children listed at the end of the roll, and we see Widow Christopher. We assume this is the Elizabeth that we saw earlier, and she has two uh, sons listed as uh, her children, William Christopher and David Christopher. 
Now, this doesn't mean that she doesn't have other children too. Uh, this may be the only ones that are of age to be taxed. She could have infants that were not taxed. We don't really know what the, what the determination was for the, for the assessor of the poor to list a, a child um, uh, on this list. They may have attained a certain age to be listed. We cannot assume that all the children that a person had would be listed, but it's a valuable clue. So our strategy then is to describe, transcribe all the persons with the same last name of Christian in these lists, plot them out by township, year, and holdings in proximity. We correlate these that records with census records, deeds, wills, guardianships if available, and we look for first appearances in the tax lists as well as dropouts. So in this instance, um, Daniel Christopher had first appeared in 1800 uh, with Barnett Christopher and Nicholas uh, Christopher. This is the 1800 census. And, and Nicholas Christopher is, is over 45. The other, the other men are 26 to 44. So they appear to be sons, Barnett and, and Daniel, whereas Nicholas, who, who is 45 plus, is probably the father and the patriarch of this group, just by looking at the census record. We can't be sure, but we would, we would compare that with some other documents. Um, we go to 1810, we see Daniel, Nicholas, Barney, uh, and David are all listed in German township in uh, this is from this index and we can then compare it with other types of records we find Aaron Christopher listed here in 1831 in an orphans court record um, being assigned to the guardianship of someone named Aaron Moore uh, who is his guardian and we can look back at the at that name and, and look at the the census records we find Aaron Moore living just a few households away from Daniel Christopher on the census so that can be a clue that Daniel is the right potential father for Aaron. And then we can go to uh, the 1820 census. We know that uh, Liza is now a widow and she's no longer a set of household. We have John, we have old Nicholas still alive. We have Samuel, we have Gideon and we have David. All of these are probably sons of Nicholas um, or they could be sons of Daniel. We don't know for sure, but we can compare their, their ages on the, on the schedules. Um, so the combination of these though, use it together allowed us to really come to the conclusion that Daniel and Elizabeth are probably the parents of Aaron because the other names appeared well into the period of time that Aaron would have been uh, an orphan and that he is probably a, a younger son of Eliza uh, and William and, and uh, David that were listed as poor children with the widow were probably uh, his older brothers. And we, indeed we found in the 1838 tax list that William Christopher and, and, and Aaron were taxed right together. Um, uh, so these tax lists were underutilized. They can be integral in solving uh, genealogical problems when used with other records. Um, they can take some time and effort to, to find and interpret. Uh, you have to look at them for all uh, and retrieve all the data from them to get the most value from them and then compare them and correlate them uh, with other, other records when available. Uh, but despite the challenge, they are worth the effort. And I hope I've shown you two, two different examples, one where there's no other, other records to use to, to correlate, and one where there is, where uh, the records can be used in, in a very helpful way. Again, thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for another Genealogy Center program. And thank you, John, for a wonderful program. So thank you, thank you everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye.